Good morning. Great to see you all this morning and those online watching us. We welcome you all for our annual Christmas program. So excited to have you here. Why don't we have a word of prayer and we'll get started. Well, thank you, Father, for an opportunity to, to invest more time in drama and music to celebrate Christ. Lord Father, I don't think in all my years that you could ever make a big deal, too big of a deal, about Jesus, since he is the center of our life. Lord, without him, our life falls apart as a Christian. So Lord, thank you for an event like this where we could set aside time to focus on this morning the hope of the message of Christ. So, Father, in a world of hopelessness, we come here to find our hope, to tap into the root of our hope and joy as a Christian. So thank you for everybody that is involved in this to make this possible. And thank you for so many who are gathered here today to worship with us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. The long-awaited one had been promised, a Messiah, the hope of the world. Yet after years and years of waiting and watching, not one had come. They knew the promise that had been foretold by the prophet Isaiah. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom. Finally, God was about to fulfill his promise. Watch with me as we portray for you the fulfillment of that promise. Jesus, the hope of the world. We arrived in Jerusalem, the holy city, for the feast. What a special time for our people. The road we traveled was narrow, and there were so many people traveling for the feast. We set up our tent near the entrance of the holy city. Joseph's tent is also near ours. The temple is beautiful and is set up high on top of a hill. Father told me today about one of the rabbis is reading out of Isaiah, the prophet, about the promised child that God would send to rule on the throne of David. Just to think that our God would send a savior, perhaps from one of our own relatives, thrills me. We have heard this story so many times. Maybe it will be soon. I wonder when God will fulfill his plan. On our way home, mother asked me about Joseph. I told her about my love for him. She said, Joseph is a good man. 
How exciting that, I, that Joseph and I are betrothed. What wonderful days. Joseph often comes to talk with father and mother about Israel and his plans for our life together. Our wedding is planned, and I can hardly wait until Joseph and I are married. What joy to think of spending my life with him. My heart is troubled. I don't know what to think. An angel appeared unto me as I knelt in prayer. He told me I would be the mother of the Messiah. He saw how startled I looked and quickly explained, you will conceive and bear a son and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the son of the most high. Then the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. I said, how can this be? I am still a virgin in my father's house. But he simply replied, there is no cannot with God. And immediately he was gone, and I was all alone again. I cannot understand what has happened, but as I think of the words the angel told me, I hear wonderful news that my cousin, Elizabeth, is going to have a son in her old age. What a miracle. I leave home and travel to Jerusalem. Perhaps she will understand more about what the angel has told me. Elizabeth met me at the door of their tiny house. And before I could even fully greet her, she cried out with a loud voice and called me blessed among women and that the fruit of my womb was also blessed. Three months have passed so quickly since I've been with Zachariah and Elizabeth. 
Oh, what joyous days we had together. I leave for home today. Farewell, Zachariah and Elizabeth. Finally, I arrive home in Nazareth. Mother and I weep together. Joseph will soon see me. He came tonight for me, but I did not want to see him. Mother tried to talk to him and explain, but she could not. He went away in great horror. How could this be happening to him? He wondered. He's playing to send me away secretly to avoid the embarrassment and shame for me. Oh, Lord God, what shall I do? How can this be your will? My parents have my parents have talked with Mary's parents and arranged our marriage. Our formal betrothal was special and complete with ceremony and celebration. This was the first time I met Mary. I was more fortunate than most as I fell in love with Mary, my betrothed, from the start. The more I got to know her, the more I loved her. I was looking forward to spending my life with her and raising our children together. When Mary returned home from visiting her cousin, Elizabeth, I was shocked when her mother told me the disturbing news. Mary was expecting a baby. How could this be? Her mother told me a story about an angel visiting Mary, but I found it hard to believe. The child was to be the Messiah. All I knew was the child was not mine. Initially, I was furious. Mary had disgraced me and brought me shame. I was heartbroken, both because I was betrayed and because I knew what would happen to Mary. I would be expected to break off the betrothal and formally divorce her and put her away. I just couldn't believe all this. The only thing I could do was to send her away, but I still loved her and decided I would do it as quietly as possible. That's what I would do, put her away quietly. I had made my decision. I tried to sleep that night, but sleep came very slowly for me. My mind turned it over and over again, all the things I had been told. I didn't want to do what society would expect, I wanted to scream. I wanted to say, I don't care what you think. I do love Mary, and she will be my wife anyways. But I knew that choice would be difficult, and my carpentry business would suffer for it. No one would ever do business with me again. Even my family would abandon me and treat me as if I had leprosy. Life would quickly become difficult for me. After what seemed like hours, I finally fell asleep. But suddenly, I had a most vivid dream. I realized that I was not alone, and I saw something I had never seen before. The angel of the Lord appeared to me and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived of her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. At that moment, I felt peace. I no longer wondered about what to do. The angel smiled at me, and as quickly as he had arrived, he was gone. Suddenly, I was wide awake, and I sat up in bed. I knew what I must do. I will tell Mary. T Mary will be my wife, and I will trust this message that God sent to me by the angel. The next day, I went to see Mary. She saw me as I approached and stopped. She looked nervous and afraid. I told her about the dream I had and that I still wanted her to be my wife. We agreed to keep this whole matter among ourselves. We would trust God that things would work out just as we had been told. We were soon mar married. I'm Joseph of Nazareth. A carpenter, a common man from the line of David. I am betrothed to a young girl. An angel appeared to her. Mary, don't fear. Righteous one, don't be a 
afraid. I bring a message from God. And he said unto her, You'll bear a son, he'll be the one, the Messiah, God's son. Mary exclaimed, How can this be? I have not known a man. It cannot be. I am with child from God above. It cannot be. Joseph will not believe me. But when he found out this, he had a dream. An angel came as he lay in his bed. He said to him, Joseph, don't fear. This child is sent down from God. Joseph, it's true. He'll be God's son, sent from above. I must now go and take Mary as my wife. Caesar Augustus made an order that all the descendants of Israel were to be registered. We were on our way to, out to Bethlehem because we were the family of David. When we arrived, the city was so full with people everywhere. Mary needed to find a place to rest as the trip was long and she would soon give birth but all the inns were full. I begged and pleaded with the innkeepers, offering to pay more, but there simply was no room anywhere. Finally, a kind innkeeper said that we could use his stable. It was not at all what I wanted or expected, but I kindly accepted. And there we settled in and prepared to spend our night. Mary no sooner had got settled in the stable where her labor pains began. It was a long night for both of us. Later that night, there in that stable, a baby boy was born. Mary wrapped the baby with strips of cloth and laid him in the manger. I called his name Jesus, just as the angel had instructed me. He will save his people from their sins, I remembered. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Fullness of grace in man's human frailty, this is the wonder of Jesus. Laying aside his power and glory, Thank you. 
We came and asked to see the baby. Joseph looked up, startled at us, as we stood near the entrance of the stable. Of course, Joseph replied, come in and see. Joseph asked us what we were doing here while our flocks were out in the fields. We told him we were in the field when suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared. The whole sky seemed brighter than we'd ever seen it before. The angel said, do not be afraid, for behold, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was a whole army of angels praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward people. And as quickly as they appeared, they were gone. And we asked ourselves, What just happened? We decided to leave our flocks and find the baby. It is true. It is just as the angel had told us. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And they brought Jesus up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simon, and this man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been re it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to carry out for him the custom of the law, then he took him in his arms 
and blessed God and said, Now, Lord, you are letting your bondservant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all these peoples, a light for the revelation of the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And his father and mother were amazed at the things which were being said about him. And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and people. Jesus' earthly ministry began after his baptism by John with the choosing of the 12 disciples that would become his closest friends. After spending about three years doing miracles, healing those with diseases, and teaching, Jesus taught his disciples of his death. After celebrating the Passover meal with them and telling them of his soon appointed death, Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. It was nearly dark when Jesus entered Gethsemane. It was a still, quiet spot and one of the places he had spent many solitary nights in prayer. The eleven solemnly followed him as he approached the entrance to the garden. Judas had already gone to betray the Lord. He signified to his three closest disciples, Peter and James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, to come with him as he motioned to the others to remain near the garden entrance. Jesus told the three, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. Before any of them had a chance to reply, he went further into the garden and cried out in prayer to his father. My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Returning to Peter, James, and John, he called out to them, but found them asleep and said to Peter, So you men could not keep watch with me for one hour? Keep watching and praying so that you do not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus went away a second time and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. After he left them again and went away and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let's go. Behold, the one who is betraying me is near. So when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they shouted, saying, Crucify! Crucify! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no grounds for charges in his case. And when they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him, and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen wrappings with spices, as was the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden was a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. Therefore, because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. It's unthinkable that Jesus would become God in flesh and dwell among us to become our sacrificial lamb for sin. Yes, it's unthinkable, yet glorious, that Jesus would become sin for us. Dying as our sacrifice, he came alive again the third day to prove he had fulfilled God's sacrifice 
for our sin. I direct you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep the commandment without fault or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Jesus came as a baby, knowing his destiny of the cross. All of this was accomplished that he might be, then and now, the hope of the world. Thank you, choir, and everyone who was involved in that. Uh, did you know John wrote that entire program, including the music and the drama, everything from A to Z? He put that whole thing together, and they've been working hard on this. So how about we show them our appreciation? <laughs> the
Yeah, far greater talent than I have, that's for sure. Um, I was focusing on a word in the title of the program today, and the word's hope. Hope. Don't you need hope in life? If you were a Jew living back, oh, say, around 6 B.C., that's quite a while ago, um, you didn't have a lot of hope. In fact, if you lived anywhere near the Mediterranean Ocean, you were under the thumb of the Roman Empire. That was not always such a cakewalk, don't you know? Um, they were a brutal people. They ruled with an iron fist. And the Jews, of all people, couldn't stand the presence of Romans in their city of Jerusalem with all of their plurality of gods and idols and images that they set up. It's a horrible thing. And then if you tried to take a trip, you traveled on Roman roads. They were marked by Roman images. And there were Roman tax collectors waiting to take your money. There was Roman tax that many felt was unfair. And on top of all that, being a Jew, God went dark, silent. Not just for a day, not just for a year, but 400 years of silence. Where did Yahweh go? Has he left us to be enslaved by the Romans also? Where is our great God? It was a tough time. The Maccabean revolt is in the rearview mirror. They tried to overthrow Rome, and that didn't work out so well. Many a thousand were crucified by Roman soldiers because of their uprising. So where is the hope? The Jews must have been wondering, well, what was Isaiah talking about after all? No prophet is speaking. There's no new revelation. There's nothing new written in Scripture. God just disappeared. So where really is our hope? It's pretty bleak, pretty dark. And yet, an angel made a visit one day, on an ordinary day, for the scum of the earth. These shepherds were out there just doing their job, a thankless job. It's what they've done every day for many, many years, but this day was much different because the sky lit up that day with an angel who came straight from God. God's going to break his silence, and he's going to break it with shepherds of all people and tell them that there is actual good news. There is hope, finally hope, that what Isaiah spoke about is now found in Bethlehem in a feeding trough that animals eat out of. There's your hope. Follow the brightest star that you see illuminated in the sky and when you follow it, you'll find the hope in a manger. A little baby, Yeshua, there's your hope. There's the hope of hundreds and hundreds of years gone by. A little child, that's your hope. So today, this story, it's not just a story. I mean, it's, it's our hope as Christians, right? This is 2020. A year you'd rather just forget. It's almost over. A year of COVID, a year of quarantine, a year of masks, and a year of sickness and disease and death, a year of unemployment, a year of just tragedy, a year of great depression, anxiety, and hopelessness, and suicide. And the list goes on and on and on and on. Where's the hope in 2020? It's found in a person called Jesus and nothing has changed over 2,000 years. That as Christians, our hope is found in a person called Jesus who died for our sins, who rose again, and now is in heaven. And one day a trumpet's going to sound. And that's our hope of Thessalonians 5, that that trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ will rise and that we who are alive and remain, the Bible says, will be snatched up or caught away in a blink of an eye. How's that for hope? I believe we're at the very doorstep of the rapture. I really do. I believe it could happen any second now, maybe today. Hope, hope. Did you know that hope lies within you today 
online, it lies within you if you've put your faith in Jesus Christ alone as your personal Savior apart from works. That's the hope you're going to carry out of this building and into Washington County to let your light so shine. So let this be a reminder of what we're really about. Let's not get down and out because of all the things that have happened this year. It may be tough, but it's not too tough for Christ. And, and you've got hope that your unsaved friend or neighbor just doesn't have, and they desperately need that hope. So share the hope today, this week, and in the coming months, they desperately need hope.